Good morning. What a joy to worship the Lord with you once again. Allow me to greet you with a belated Happy New Year and an advanced Happy New Year at the same time. Not very often you could say that, right? Uh, only we who have two cultures uh, can appreciate something like that. This morning while I was doing my devotion, the Lord placed a, uh, one of my favorite hymns. Uh, uh, remind me, and once again, place it in my heart. It's a hymn that I don't hear very often, but I think it's very appropriate as we are in this, uh, the threshold of a, of a new year before us, uh, ought to be our prayer. Can I just read this, uh, the words of this hymn for you? The title is More Like the Master. Right? I, don't know, I hope uh, you guys, those of you who are been in church for a while, we sung this to our hearts to light. I think the younger people, may, maybe not as much, but the words are appropriate. Uh, not just for a new year, but every single day. This is what hymn writer Charles Weevil says. More like the master I would ever be. More of his meekness, more humility. More zeal to labor, more courage to be true. More consecration for work he bids me do. More like the master is my daily prayer. More strength to carry the crosses I must bear. More earnest effort to bring his kingdom in, more of his spirit, the wonder to win. More like the master I would live and grow, more of his love to others I would show. More self-denial like his, like his in Galilee, more like the master I long ever be. Take thou my heart, I would be thine alone. Take my heart and make it thine own. Purge me from sin, O Lord, I now implore. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. That was my prayer this morning. And I ask the Lord to work in my heart through this year for that. And I pray that that is your desire as well as we venture into this exciting new year with the Lord. Once again, let me ask you to join me as we ask for the Lord's blessing on this word today. Lord, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. Would you now speak to us, O Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to get together with a friend I haven't seen for many years. Actually, I calculated close to 30 years. One of those um, childhood friends that I'm sure many of you knew, but somehow lost track through the years. I still remember this friend because uh, we used to pray together, we study the Bible together, we even go to church together. In fact, I remember we uh, were very active uh, in church that we helped out with different programs in the church. So, so, so basically, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, faithful ones uh, during the early years of our time. But somehow, once we got into college, things changed. Somehow this friend of mine just stopped coming and we lost track of each other. I kind of knew where he is, but at the same time I know that he decided that he's kind of wanting to uh, do something else than what he has been doing. The last that I heard of him was that he got married and that he was very busy with his career. Well, sure enough, uh, recently I got together with this friend again you know, it's one of those you could imagine, you know, at first it was kind of awkward, you know, you don't know, you know, what, what will we talk about, what will we say, how will we uh, catch up, things like this, but after that initial, um, you know, kind of awkwardness, soon we were laughing and telling stories of our past, and, and we picked up where we left off, so to speak. Well, knowing that I'm a pastor, I, I have to ask the question, have you been to church lately? I asked this friend of mine. He paused and answered an answer that I was kind of expecting. Well, not really. But what he said next was quite revealing. He said, I've been away from God for so long that I don't know how to come back. I've been away for so long I don't know how to come back. I wonder if someone were to ask you that question or express their sentiment in that way, what would you say? I hope you would realize that my friend is not asking for the direction to church. You know, it's not that he doesn't know what street to take to get to church. 
But somehow in his heart, he felt like he's been so removed from God to the point that he doesn't know if, how does he approach God, let alone how does he get back with God, so to speak. As we looked at the book of Jonah, I think we have a, a similar situation. We learn of a prophet who ran away from God. We're not told exactly why Jonah ran away. We have a lot of guesses. But we're not told explicitly why he did. We just know that he went exactly opposite to what God told him to go. You know, as I think about Jonah, I also doubt that Jonah, uh, I doubt Jonah thought he could get away from God. He's smart enough. He knows the scripture enough to know there's no way you could run away from God. So my guess is maybe Jonah was just, uh, maybe he was just tired of being a prophet. Maybe he thought he wanted to be a sailor, you know, who knows, I don't know, uh, for a change. Or maybe Jonah just wanted to do his own thing, you know, uh, something different than just following after the commands of, we we're not sure why. Perhaps he even did not mean to be far away from God for a long time. But soon, he's far enough that perhaps just like my friend, he wondered, how could you ever come back to God after what he had done? Picking up from the last verse of Jonah chapter 1, we read these words. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In this inhospitable place, we will learn from chapter 2 what, what it takes what does it take to come back to God? Can I share with you four thoughts that I believe we can learn from the prayer of Jonah in chapter 2? The first thing to, to uh, bear in mind is you, you or someone you know desire to come back to God is to come back to Him with honest prayer. Come back to God with honest prayer. Would you look again with me in verses 1 and 2 of Jonah chapter 2? We're told from inside the fist, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I call for help and you listen to my cry. Jump down to verse 7. Where Jonah continued on saying, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. What's Jonah saying in those words? I believe he's saying that in his most desperate, most hopeless situation, where you think that he, he couldn't be, that, that you're so far from God, God is just a prayer away. I'm sure Jonah must have remembered the words of David from Psalm 139, where he said these words, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my beds in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle to the, on the far side of the sea, even in the belly of a fish. Now, I'm sure David didn't say that, but that's exactly how where Jonah is. Even here inside the belly of the fish, your right hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. Here's the good news and the bad news. Have you ever had people say this to you? I got a good news and bad news. What, what do you like first? The good news or bad news? Normally I said, just give me the good news first and then I'll get the, yeah, I'll start the, the bad news and then give me the good news. So I, I'll do that to you. The bad news is this from Psalm 139. The bad news is you can't hide from God. You can't run away from God. And the good news, well, that's also the good news, right? But again, if you're running away, that's the last person you want to meet, obviously is God. So that's the bad news. You can't run away from God. You can't hide from Him. And here's the good news. You can always find 
God. God is there. All you need is to acknowledge Him and to speak to Him from your heart. And He hears you. But the problem is, it's not that God is not there, but most of them, most people who are running away either has a problem of they're not aware of the presence of God, or more likely, they are not ready to speak to Him. Can I share with you what I, kind of, with this friend of mine that I, I haven't seen for a long time, I followed a, a kind of three-step process to kind of guide him back to the presence of God. The first that I do is uh, I, I want my friend to sense the presence of God. And the way I do that is, uh, you know, while we're catching up, I said, you know what, um, I'd like to keep you in prayer. Is that okay? I, I'd like to pray for you. You know, I have yet to hear, whenever, you know, as a pastor, that's expected for them, to, for you to say something like that. And, and, and whenever I say that, I have never yet encountered a person that says, no, don't pray for me. No, stop that. I forbid you to pray for me. Most of the time, if you say, can I pray for you? Most people say, would more like, will, 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 in, uh, would, would more than happy to, to uh, for, with your request. And the same thing too, just say, you know, when you say, may I pray for you, I'd like to keep you in prayer. What are you doing? In a way, this person might not have thought of God at all for a long time, but in a sense, when you say, may I pray for you, you're, you're bringing the presence, you're bringing that person to a sense of the presence of God. The reason we can pray is because He is here. Use that. For someone that perhaps hasn't thought of God, just remind them, you know, you may not pray, but I want to pray for you. That's a good place to start. And then if that person is ready, you go to the next step. What do you want me to pray for you about? Sometimes the first step and the second step might take a while. You know, of course, oh no, I'm just fine. But you know what? If, you, if, if, if that person is, is ready, you say, what can I pray for you about? That, that's a second step where that person is more closer to God. You know what? God is interested with you. He's concerned with you. So if you have some things in your heart, let me know. I want to pray for you. You may not pray, ready to pray, but I will. That's step number two. And then when I sense that that person is ready, I would go to step number three. And that is to invite that prayer, that person, to join me to speak in speaking to God. You know what? We can pray together right now. You and I, right here. You know? Why don't I start? And you could follow along after. You could speak to God yourself. And I, whenever I, I think of that now, depending on the person that you are talking about, who you want to bring back to God, those are wonderful, simple baby steps on the, on, 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 the, on the way back to God. To know that God is there, God is willing to listen, and that person can open themselves up to God. For some, they might have to first encounter, unfortunately, a difficult situation like Jonah. Before they would, before they could, come into prayer. This reminds me of uh, three pastors who are debating. They were debating about the most effective position in prayer. Perhaps some of you might have heard this, but I think this is so, uh, I, I, I enjoy this, one of my favorite stories. The three pastors were debating what is the most, what is the most effective position in prayer. But the first pastor said, well, the most effective is when your hands are held together with with fingers pointed upward in worship. That is a good position in prayer. The second pastor said, no, 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 no. Real prayer is on your knees. That's the best type of prayer. The third pastor suggested that, the, 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 that both of them were wrong. The best position, he said, was praying with outstretched arms flat on your face. That is the best position. While the pastors were debating, there was an electrician that was working on an electrical post behind them who was kind of listening to their conversation, and he has to interject. He has to break in and said, you know what, I think, you know, you guys are religious people, but can I share with you what I found to be the most powerful prayer I have ever made? It is while I'm dangling upside down from a power pole suspended 30 feet from the ground, I think that's the best position in prayer. And you know what? In many cases, that's all true. When you are in the most desperate of all situations, when there is nothing else you could, no one else you could turn to, no one else, and you turn to God, I think that is the best position to be in. Regardless of your posture, we have the assurance from James chapter 4, verse 8. 
that we can draw near to God. Can you finish that statement? He will draw near to us. Come back to God with honest prayer. Jonah know that and he did that. The second thing is to come back to God with heartfelt faith. Come back to God with heartfelt faith. Let's continue reading from verse 3 to 5. And I want you to take note how Jonah understood the predicament, the situation that he is in. Verse 3 begins with these words. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. The currents swirled about me. All the waves, the breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. In these three verses, Jonah acknowledged not only is God near when we can talk and that we can talk to Him, but that God is in control over the circumstances of his life. Jonah recognizes that God's hand is in his being thrown to the sea. He says also that the waves and the breakers that swam over him, guess who they belong to? They belong to God. Martin Luther made this observation. He said, Jonah does not say the waves and the billows of the sea went over me. He didn't say that. If you read it carefully, Martin Luther reminds us, Jonah said, but your waves and your billows he said that because he felt in his conscience that the sea with the waves and the billows, they are all servants of God. God is in control over his circumstances. Furthermore, Jonah affirmed his faith in God. He was confident that God would deliver him. Look at verse 6. He said, you have brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. And then the last part of verse 9, he went on to say, salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation is God's work for us. We cannot save ourselves. Salvation is never man's work for God, even though that's how most think it to be. That is what we do for God. But that this is what separates Christianity from other faiths. Because for us, salvation is entirely of God for us. You know, I made a very interesting, you know, uh, I don't think this is unique, but as you look closer to this prayer of Jonah, there's something amazing here, something fantastic that, that if you just casually read through this, you would miss. Let me share with you this observation about Jonah's prayer. If you study the, the eight verses, the beginning eight verses of Jonah's prayer, not one of what he said is an original thought. Not one of what Jonah said, even his request, is original to Jonah. You know, uh, being in, uh, a professor in, in seminary or in a, in a school, I could say that he plagiarized, you know. Because all the things he said were already said in other parts of Scripture. Let me give you, uh, in a sense, he quoted much of this are quotes from the psalmist. Let me give you a few examples. Listen to Psalm 120, verse 1. I called on the Lord in my distress. How about Psalm 86, 13? See if this sounds familiar. You have delivered my soul from the depths. Psalm 88, verse 6. You cast me into the darkest depths. Psalm 42, verse 7. The roar of your waves has swept over me. Psalm 31, verse 22, I am cut off from your sight. Psalm 69, verse 1 to 2, The waters have come over my neck. I am in deep waters. The floods engulf me. One more. Psalm 30, verse 3, You brought me up from the pit. All of this were from the book of Psalms. And what Jonah simply did is what? He prayed the word of God. He prayed from the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, there's an important lesson here. I hope you already can connect the dots right here. 
that you can see what Jonah had, was doing or has done through his prayer. You see, Jonah has hid God's word in his heart. He memorized the scripture and that enabled him to pray out the scriptures. He had memorized much of the Bible so that in time of crises, it showed him the way back to God. You know, for those who have been away from God, one of the ways we can help rekindle their faith is by bringing to mind the words and the works of God. Somehow, it's one of those things when the seed of the Word of God is placed in our heart through either memorization or through even for Sunday school. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, this is where we, 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 we're confident that what we do is not waste. That, that as we share the word, and, and maybe sometimes you're a student, you don't, it doesn't seem like they're paying attention, but if we share it enough, that somehow we're confident down the road, perhaps they're no longer here with us, physically worship, but the Lord would use those words to bring it back to their memory, and it will be the way back, that will tell them how they come back to God. And I believe this is what Jonah did. Jonah, at the end, when he's at the most difficult circumstance of his life, he realized he had to stand on the truths of the scripture. And it will bring him back to the arms of God. So number one, we come back to God by just opening up through honest prayer. But that's not enough. We come back to God with heartfelt faith. That what we know who God is and how he revealed himself to us. That's the confidence that we draw near to Him. There's a third thought from Jonah's prayer on how to come back to God. We come back to Him with humble confession. Humble confession. For this, I want you to look at verse 8 with me. Verse 8, Jonah kind of said something that seemed to be out of place. Seemed to be not related to the theme that he was working on. But it's very important. Note that. Let, let's look at verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Where did that come from? You know, at first he's talking about his circumstance, he's describing how hard he's calling out to God, and suddenly he had this statement, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. As if he's kind of preaching at this point. I believe what Jonah is doing here is he was simply describing his own experience. You see, it was not long ago that Jonah ran away from God. We know that. He had forsaken God, and that's why he is in his predicament. And doing so, you know what Jonah is saying? I forfeit that I missed out on the grace that could have been mine if I were to just follow, if I were to just trust in God's plan and His ways. But those who cling to work, who turn to something, someone other than God, they miss out. I did it. That's why this is where I am. I miss out on what God could have, the grace of God that I could experience. Though the text does not specifically said so, I believe Jonah, by saying those words, is offering a confession. And he was repenting of the sin that he had done towards God. And we know that Jonah is repenting. Can I defend it or just demonstrate it in two ways on this prayer? Two ways we know that Jonah is confessing, he's repenting. Though you don't find the word confess or repent at all in this whole prayer. But I believe that's what he, he, he is doing. First of all, he acknowledged that everything that had happened to him while caused by God, it was his own fault. In a way, that's what he was saying. You know what? What happened to me, I deserve it. There was no, no self-righteousness. There's no defense of his own. Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. None of that. Jonah is saying that whatever, whenever a person puts something else in the place of God, thereby turning himself from God, he enabled, inevitably also turned from God's mercy, from experiencing that what God wants to give to him. Now, God is no less merciful, but in effect, this person has rejected the very source of mercy that he could receive. So that's what Jonah was doing right here. He's saying, you know what? Whatever God did, he was right. You know, I deserve what I've experienced. The second reason I believe Jonah's prayer also showed repentance is that Jonah did not ask God 
for anything. It was not a what we call quid pro quo. I'll do this and you'll do this for me, right? Let's bargain, God. All right? None of that. It was out of a sincere confession. God, you are right. God, I come to your mercy. If Jonah have kind of have, have, have a, uh, a, a, a motivation or a uh, um, you know, kind of uh, ask for something in return. God, you set, save me, and I'll do this, or I'll, you know, kind of like a, a, a thing like that. We might suspect that his repentance had a hidden motive. Perhaps Jonah was repenting just so that he could get out of the fish, get back on dry land. But if you look at it closer, closely, in reality, Jonah did not really ask for anything. For that, he was genuinely sorry for his sin. One of my favorite authors is Chuck Colson. He's a, a well-known figure in the 70s, even in the 80s. He just passed away, I believe, about a few years ago. But he's someone who, at the highest point of, well, he was obviously, uh, by the Watergate scandal in the United States, broke down. And he, like Jonah, found out about the grace of God. By his own confession, much of Chuck Colson's life was driven by pride. One day he came to see his situation clearly when he was sitting at the living room of a good friend who recently became a Christian. And as they were talking, this friend shared how he came to know Jesus. And he shared with him a chapter from C.S. Lewis' Mere Christianity. In that chapter, he quoted C.S. Lewis speaking of what pride is. C.S. Lewis said pride is the chief cause of misery in every nation and every people since the world began. By the way, for those who went, you went to see these, uh, 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 the uh, Global Disciples of Congress, uh, our, uh, Rami Zacharias had a quote too to this effect. He said, pride is at the core of the ultimate rejection of God. When you boil down all of our sin, the bottom line is we think we know better. And God. Pride is at the heart of it all. When Chuck Colson heard those words spoken from C.S. Lewis's book, when he left the house and got back to his car ready to drive up, he burst into tears. And after crying out, he prayed this prayer. This prayer. He said, God, I don't know how to find you, but I'm going to try. I'm not much the way I am now, but somehow I want to give myself to you. Take me, God. What Colson was saying is that the moment he realized he doesn't want that pride anymore, he wants to come to God for he realized he was a sinner. And the God who received sinners heard him and led him to a knowledge of Christ and the assurance of salvation in him. I believe that's what happened with Jonah too. He just was brought down to the end of himself. And Jonah confessed. In the same way we too need to confess our sins. Be it something, something uh, obvious or something implicit. Even the most basic and the most fundamental, which is pride itself. And if we confess our sin, we have the promise of 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins, God is faithful and He is just, and He will forgive our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. The way back to God is to honestly open up our soul in prayer, to come back to God with heartfelt faith, and finally to come back to Him with humble confession. But there's one last thing that Jonah and his experience has to, has, can guide us in our, in our journey back to God. Come back to God in holy prayers. I think this is the, you know, the first three could be maybe personal, but this last one is the one that we would say is a visible manifestation that truly we're our own way, or on our way back to God, and that is with holy prayers. Come back to God with holy prayers. Look with me in verse 9. Jonah ended his prayer saying, But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. 
Salvation comes from the Lord. What did just Jonah did? Well, he, he vowed to worship the Lord in a manner that, des that deserve, is deserving of God. And because God had delivered him, by the way, uh, many people believe that Jonah chapter 2 is not a prayer actually. It's actually a praise. Jonah was thanking God that he didn't drown all the way. That, that he was, now he doesn't know how, I, I don't know if he knows he's inside the fish. It doesn't seem that he described himself, but he's still alive. And in fact, he was thanking God for already saving him. Now he's still in a difficult situation, but he's already thanking God at this point. That God was merciful and gracious, and, and he will sing a song of thanksgiving to God and to offer sacrifices that is fitting for what God has done for him. I once heard of a church that wanted to have a new awakening in their midst. So the church people start praying, and, and, and they get to the point they're begging God, God, please revive our church. God, we beg you. We want this. And then there was a preacher who came and saw what the people are doing, and, and then he made a suggestion. He said, you know what? Yes, God wants us to pray and ask for revival. But you know what God wants to? He said, we praise Him. Why don't you, you know, just, just praise Him. Make your fo focus praising God. And the, pe the church people did that. They began Wednesday night, they began to worship and praise God. And you see something, they didn't feel something different in their midst. They continued praising God on Thursday. And they praise God, and this is more, even more evident on Friday. You know, by Sunday, things have changed dramatically. Somehow there's a newness in the midst of God's people in this church. What has just happened? You see, through praise, God's people are returning to their first love. Soon hearts, hardened hearts are melting. Focus is no longer on themselves or what they want. The focus is on what God wants and what they can do for God. And praise had done it. Ever feel like you're, you're dead? That you're somehow withering away in your faith? Can I give you a suggestion? How about begin by praising God? Now, I'm not saying this is the only thing, but set your heart in praising God. If your focus and your desire is after God, something wonderful is bound to happen. Jonah also said, what I have vowed, I will make good. Now we're not told what Jonah vowed, you know, what promise he made God here. But we do know that Jonah was committed to obeying God. That after he after after he uh, was uh, got out of the fish, God didn't say, you know, let's make a deal. Go back to no, no, no. He was on his way to Nineveh. So it has some possibly something to do with that. That Jonah was now committed to obey God, that he's going to do what God wants him to do. That's a, this reminds me of a, of a, a woman who went up to her pastor and, and asked the pastor, Pastor, could you please in a few words tell me what consecration means? You know, being devoted, dedicated to God. Could you, could you explain in a few words what that means to me? And a pastor holding out a blank piece of paper said, well, consecration, being committed to God, is something like this. It's signing your name on the bottom of this piece of blank sheet of paper and let God fill it as He wills. I like that. Commitment to God, consecration, dedication to God is signing your name in the bottom of this blank sheet and say, God, here, fill it. I'll do whatever you say I should do. I like that. I think that's a good description. I think that's what Jonah said. God, here, I sign it. Tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And then what happened to Jonah once he got to that point? Well, verse 10 ends. And the Lord commanded this fish, and it vomited Jonah unto dry land. Doesn't sound very, I mean, I wish the Lord said, and, and the fish just gently put Jonah into the shore. He vomited. So it must not be a very... Uh, it's still a very dramatic scene right there, but it's a, nonetheless a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture of, of how God brought back His wayward servant. When a person falls into sin, when a person wanders away, we have here a picture of a person that all they need to do is to come back to God. I'm sure in the beginning there's some hesitancy, there's some fear, but when they finally take that step, they discover that God is ready. God is waiting to answer with open arms. 
Jonah discovered that the road back to God begins with an honest prayer. Lord, I'm in trouble. Lord, I'm turning back to you. And at the same time, he found that when he comes back to God with heartfelt faith, with humble confession, and with holy praise, he finds out that he, and he is in the loving arms of the Lord. He's back where God wants him to be. My prayer is perhaps there's some here in our midst. Maybe you're here because um, you know you feel like you need to go somewhere. You want to find an answer back to God. I pray that some of the, the, the thought from Jonah's life give you the answer. How to come back to God. Or maybe you know someone who's been wandering away. And you might be just a person that God would use to help that person be that guidepost or that signpost the way back to God. Praying that Jonah's experience will help us to do just that. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, your God, who is first of all me, and a God who is distant, a God who is uncaring, unaware of the circumstances of our life, but someone who is intimately acquainted, intimately aware, passionately interested in the events of our life. And the thing that we desire more is that we are near your heart. If there's anyone here who perhaps can say we are like Jonah, wandering away. Physically, we might be here, but our heart is far. I pray that you would touch their heart and bring them close to yours. Help them, them to see how you're there waiting for them and desiring to grant them mercy and grace. Perhaps we know of others, maybe a cohort or our family member who have been wandering away. Lord, I pray that, that we would take those initial steps on their behalf to pray for them and if you give us the opportunity to point them in the right direction, to know that you, God, are waiting for them so that they will be back in the folds and the arms of our loving Heavenly Father. And if there's some that we know who do not have a relationship with you, but realizing if this is the kind of God that we worship, Lord, we want everyone to know you in a personal and living way. Lord, would you remind us of this? Would you challenge us with this? so that we all would know you. We pray this in Jesus' name.